I have many times impressed upon you, Watson, the danger of attempting to reason from insufficient evidence. So, let us review our present knowledge of this manor house affair. A peddler, having visited the house, has almost immediately afterwards been found dead. His last message has led to the discovery that the supposedly invalid lady of the house was formerly a character impersonator on the music hall stage. A number of dummies stolen from various shops about the region have been brought by gypsies to the house and after dark observation has revealed them being used in some curious charade. Furthermore, somewhere about the house a three-legged dog is unaccountably being concealed. And finally, what is the significance of the midnight arrival of that muffled horseman? All right, if I come in for a moment. Tom Hudson, what are you doing here so early? I brought this for young Sherlock. He asked me to get it for him in London. And I brought this for you. Why, Mr. Hudson, a pincushion box. In the shape of art. So I see. And inside, a little Billy do. Mr. Hudson, really? It's a fresh appeal to you, Liza Ann, to marry me and become Mrs. Hudson. I will, Tom. I've already said I will. Ah, but when? No, no, we have no reason for any further delay. Not now I have the little house my mother left me in Baker Street. You'd be happy there, I know you would. I mean, it lies at the very heart of the Empire and... Within a few miles of no less than seven mainline termini. I mean, you couldn't be more convenient. So when's it to be? Just give me three or four more days, Tom, and you shall have your answer. Mr. Hudson, I hope you have a very good reason for being in this kitchen. Indeed I have, ma'am. The very best. Plain good art in this. I brought that package from Mr. Sherlock as bid. I'm just leaving. I have to visit the landlady of the Black Horse, whose sister in the Pentonville Road has entrusted me not only with a message, but with a birthday gift of some value. Good day, ladies. You know, Mrs. Cunliffe, there's something about railway guards that I simply cannot take to. They give themselves airs, which can hardly be justified by the temporary possession of two flags and a whistle. And they do say they make notoriously bad husbands. Sherlock. That man Hudson brought you this from London. Oh, splendid. How kind of him. Nevertheless, I do wish you would refrain from encouraging that man. He spoons on Mrs. Cunliffe, isn't he, Mama? I'm sure I don't know what you mean, child. One day he'll carry her off. And then he'll make me gingerbread rabbits. What do you got there, boy? That's a magnifying lens. I asked Hudson to buy it for me at Pillishers in New Bond Street. Hmm. Must have cost a pretty penny. Two pounds. Two pounds? Where in heaven's name did you get two pounds to waste on a magnifying lens? Uh, from Grandmama. She sent me two sovereigns. You Grandmother did? Yes. From France. To Charlotte Whitney. Well, upon my soul, Brother Gideon. And are we not to be trusted? Two whole sovereigns, boy. And never a penny to your aunt as provides for you. Well, not that we're interested in money. Oh. Well, the last thing we look for is money, but I do think you should have offered some, some small amount, some, some token. Gratitude, boy. Gratitude. I'm sorry, I didn't think. Oh, Brother Gideon, how can you expect a boy to think of such things? Especially a boy like him, brought up amongst people for whom money hath no meaning. People without the slightest conception of what it is to scrimp and save and deny oneself that others may never have to go without. Where's my thank you? You'd best take that magnifying lens to your room, boy. And that symbol of prodigality will only upset her the more. <laughs> I hope she
hope she doesn't want her smelling salts. I gave them to the goldfish. I wonder what time the professor left last night. It was after three. Hmm. I heard the clocks. Well, I must have been deep in the land or not by then. Chatting away to Jasper for hours he was. Thank you. And he's arranged for that there moon she to come here sometime today. Put me through my paces all right, he will. You've got absolutely nothing to worry about, my dear. Well, he is hoping. I say, Henry. What? You really was in India, wasn't you? Yes. Why? Well, why'd they call this fella a moon she? I mean, what exactly is a moon she? Well, it's native lingo for a secretary or language teacher. That's all nothing special. Don't let him worry you, my dear. I'll try not to. But I won't half be glad when it's all over. Well, me too, Bessie. Me too. I passed the remainder of that wretched morning alone in my room. Despite the trouble it had caused me, I was immensely proud of my beautiful new magnifying lens and spent much time in a detailed examination of the objects on my dressing table. Among these, by the purest chance, there happened to be that unusually large rose thorn which I had discovered on the floor of my hideaway in the woods where Natty Dan had died. Suddenly, viewing it through the glass, I became aware of something puzzling about its appearance. your roses, Mama. Off my roses? Who is? He is. He's bug hunting. He'll have boxes of beetles in his bedroom, I shouldn't wonder. Well, I'm not going to stand for that. Sherlock, you just leave my roses alone. I'm not having your bedroom full of beetles. Beatles. Oh. Why does that boy always look at me as though he doesn't understand what I'm talking about? Back in my room, I examined a number of thorns I had gathered from various rose bushes in the garden. There was no mistaking the fact. The thorn I had discovered in the woods, though undoubtedly from a cultivated bush, exhibited certain minute indentations that were to be found on none of the others. I therefore determined on an experiment. Well, the shall must be finished by now. What time's your station, Master Dean? We should be here by noon. Oh, we'd best be getting down. Fruit. Oranges and pears. Apples? Oh, yes. Very large, indigestible apples. Games? Cards, chess, drafts. And do you prefer your house to be hot or cold? Oh, cold. All doctors say that heat is unwholesome, but cold is wholesome. Good. You are familiar with the works of Felix Mendelssohn? Yes. Are there any of his songs that have a special appeal for you? The Pilgerspruch. Lass dich nur. I can even sing you one written by his sister Fanny. Schöner und schöner schmuckt sich. Sie sicher Deutschland besucht? Tatsächlich. Köln, Brühl, Bonn. Sie haben soeben dort eine Statue von Beethoven aufgestellt. Or si vous avez visité la France? Bien sûr. Paris, Versailles. C'était au mois d'août, je me rappelle. Il y avait une fête. Je pourrais même vous dire ce que portait l'impératrice au génie. Une robe blanche, un chapeau en soie blanche, avec un monti et un parasol en verre. Stand. Sit. Now rise and walk towards the door.
turn and come towards me. I see that the Queen's rheumatism has become progressively worse. Excellent. Excellent. Her command of the languages is truly amazing. To have become so fluent in so short a time. She has a natural ear, a gift of tongues. If the rest of your plans are in as good a state of preparedness, we are indeed ready. Oh, lovely. When is it going to be? The professor told me just before he left this morning that if you passed all the Munchies tests, my dear, we would go ahead as planned. We move in two days' time. Excuse me, sir. Mr. Prendergast is here. Now, the Preston Station Master, gentlemen. Show him in. If you will step behind here, you will be able to observe this man. <clears throat> Mr. Prendergast, sir. Ah, oh, Prendergast. Good to see you, old chap. Uh, you've met my young nephew, Jasper. Yes, of course, you haven't. Uh, Mrs. Turnbull, you know, of course. Good day, Mrs. Turnbull. Mr. Prendergast. I do hope you're feeling a little better than when we last met, Mum. Much the same, I'm afraid. There is, alas, no cure for long years spent in a, an inhospitable climate. I blame myself. We should have come home years before. Oh, one doesn't think... However, I invited you here because, as a fellow lepidopterist, I thought you might like to see some superb specimens that arrived a week or two ago from India. Oh, how marvellous. <laughs> I'm not very well up in the Indian species. <laughs> They're come. I'll show them to you. <laughs> well, yes, I shall know him when I see him again. Then it will not be long. It will soon be home. And the blood of our forefathers will not have been spilt in vain. Do you know, that confounded Captain Chumley turned up at the office again this morning. I was forced to sneak out the back door to avoid the man. I've not the slightest sympathy with you, Gideon. You brought the whole thing entirely upon yourself, promising to give him a subscription for a military magazine or whatever it is he's going around with. Nevertheless, he should not pester. He should be able to take a hint. I have been out to that man on no fewer than three occasions now, and still he calls his plain bad manners. No, this is too bad. Where is that boy? And where is Mrs. Conley? You might have a word with her, my dear. You know I like to have my luncheon on the table, sharp at once. Oh, Mum, come quick. I've just been up to fetch Mr Sherlock and there's something ever so wrong with him. He's ill, Mum. It's all right, Mrs Cunliffe. Keep calm. I'm coming. You two stay where you are. I'll send for you if I need you. Sherlock. Are you all right? Uh, yes, I am now, aren't Rachel? Oh, he was collapsed, Mum, and he was breathing ever so bad. How long have you been like this? 22 minutes and 15 seconds precisely. Do you know, it's just as I suspected. Sherlock? Your lunch is ready. Stop without me. I may be some time. You just wait until he gets home. I shall have a word or two to say to our young Master Sherlock. John, is there any known poison that might give symptoms similar to those of tetanus? Uh, yes. Some of the vegetable alkaloids might, for example, strychnine and the like. Strychnus nux vomica. Is a tree native to India and Ceylon, from the fruits of which may be extracted strychnine. A sentence from some long lost textbook drifts back to me down the years. Then is it George, not possible mind, that Natty Dan George might have died not as you thought from tetanus, but from poisoning by some such vegetable alkaloid, some strychnine like substance? Yes, it is possible. It's also highly unlikely. Yes, but, but how do you imagine such a poison might have been administered, young? I think you will find, if you carry out the appropriate tests, 
that this thorn contains traces of such a poison. Aha! Uh -huh. Someone taking the leaf from the book of the Amazonian Indians, eh? They poison their arrows with curare, you know. Also a vegetable alkaloid derived from the trees of the genus Strictus and propel them into the skins of their victims with a blowpipe. And you think, Sherlock, that that is how Natty Dan died? Of course not. Then how? A dog with a thorn on its paw. What? It is entirely consistent with all the known facts. Well, I told you I'd found the tracks of a three-legged dog outside the hut, and that such a dog is almost certainly being concealed somewhere about the manor. I've never heard such nonsense in all my life. If a dog has a poison thorn in its paw, then the poison would kill the dog. I said on its paw, not in it. Just suppose the thorn well, the other way up. Well, in that case, the thorn would not be projecting into the dog. The dog would have no reason to walk three-legged. Ah, but might it not have been trained especially to do so? Oh. In order to prevent the thorn it was carrying from becoming blunted. Oh. But why would anyone go to such elaborate lengths to kill someone like Natty Dan? Precisely. Oh, I don't think they did. I think the killing of Natty Dan was pure accident. They were, if you like, experimenting on him. They are after far bigger fish. I say, you two still here? Shouldn't you be out on your rounds yes, by now? Yes, we are just going, my dear. Come along, George. You will have to wait. Look, leave it there. Come back in a couple of hours. I'll see what I can do. Goodbye, my dear. Sherlock, have you written to your grandmother yet, thanking her for that money she sent? Not yet. But I will. I got it the most awful hot water over that, you know, for not handing it over to Aunt Rachel for my keep. But why should you do that? Your grandmother sends her a very generous monthly allowance for the purpose. She sends her money. Are you sure? Yes, of course I am. Thank you. Thank you. That puts rather a different complexion on things. I want a word with you. And I with you, Aunt Rachel. I will not tolerate your leaving this house as soon as a meal is about to be brought to the table. It is surely not too much to ask. So long as you choose to accept the hospitality of this home, you show us some little consideration. And do not willfully and continually disrupt the routine of this house. Perhaps equally, Aunt Rachel, it is not too much to ask that you be honest with me. And what exactly do you mean by that? You receive money, ample money, for my keep. My grandmother sends it to you regularly from France. I am not living on your charity, yet I am frequently made to feel like an urchin from the ragged school here, only on sufferance. Oh, Sherlock, you poor dear boy. You can't surely feel like that. Why, I do my very best to make you feel wanted, to give you a mother's love and affection, to give you a good home, to make you feel part of a real family again. <laughs> Oh. That is the second time, boy, today that you've reduced your aunt to tears. I'm sorry, I, uh... <laughs> I know nothing of any money coming from France. Did I not mention it? You most certainly did not. Oh, it's a pittance. Nevertheless. Mere pittance. In the circumstances, it might be appropriate for me, for me to reduce somewhat my admittedly modest contribution towards his upkeep. You must do as you please, Brother Gideon. But monetary considerations have never been paramount in this house, and I hope and pray that I shall never allow them to become so. Now, you just eat that all up, Mr. Sherlock. It'll do you good. Always missing your meals like that. You'll make yourself ill, you will. Oh, and Tom, you put this in your bag for the journey. It's a meat and potato pie. Oh, beautiful. As we steam through the coast, be tunnel lies around. I should be thinking of you. I must get peckish when we go through that tunnel. Oh, that reminds me. Forgot to leave this for you this morning, Mr. Holmes. Thought you might like it. With my compliments. Bradshaw's Railway Guide. Thank you, Tom. That's most useful. You 
two and your trains. I say, funny thing. I bumped into an old pal of mine at the Black Horse this morning. Old Prendergast. He's station master at Preston now. But he comes out here a good deal, it seems. Great friend of that Colonel Turnbull up at the Manor House. Did this station master say he'd been up at the Manor House today? Yeah, he did. Just come away. So, Tom, another piece falls into place. Three o'clock. I must be off. Mrs. Cunliffe, your kitchen is a haven of sanity. And as long as you're living here, you'll always be welcome in it, Mr. Sherlock. You know that. Poor lad. You know, sometimes I feel so sorry for him. Well, I suppose that gives me my answer, doesn't it, Liza Ann? About becoming Mrs. Hudson? All in good time, Tom. I couldn't let him down. But it'll not be for long. You'll see. Well, you're right. Poison. A soporific vegetable alkaloid. But one with which I'm totally unfamiliar. How did you suspect a rose thorn? I didn't. Not for some time. Not till I noticed those small marks on it which indicated that it had been held in some sort of metal instrument. Then I asked myself why it might have been. You do realise that now I shall have to notify Sergeant Grimshaw. Natty Dan's body will have to be exhumed. Give me a few hours. I'm sorry, A few hours sure. can make no difference to that. It is imperative that we take a closer look at the manor house and that we do so without further delay. Yeah, we... Are you game? Well, I... Oh, come, John, you have to admit that to date I've been unerringly correct in my deductions. Yes, that's all very well, Then sure. I shall I'm go not... alone. No. <sighs> now, wait, I suppose I'd better come too. If only to keep you out of mischief. That's the spirit. The flame of adventure may be guttering and low, but at least it's not totally extinguished. <laughs> what are you doing now? Writing a note to Charlotte. She'll want to know where I am. Ah, uh, women. Dusk was already beginning to fall when John Whitley and I finally broke cover from Pendard Woods and stepped onto Manor House lands, I carrying an old dark lantern of Dr. Sauerbrunn's. There appeared to be no sign of life, either at the house or in the grounds, and the silence was eerie as we sprinted for the shelter of the old coach house. I ran my eyes quickly over the colonel's coach. A glance at his interior confirmed my suspicions that it was different from when it was sent to collect us for that interesting tea party at the manor house. as I expected. A false bottom. Smuggling, in a manner of speaking, is somewhat crap, too. 